Hello chicos, hello chicas, welcome everyone chess lovers. We are going to revisit one of my favorite topics, the isolated queen pawn. This is a structure that always has something cool to offer. And um, I played a game a couple of hours ago and it reminded me of an idea that I wanted to share with the world of the internet or YouTube or rather the uh, chess coach Andras aficionados and trust me you are going to value this lesson so um, I'm going to show you first the position that I would like to talk about which by the way can be reached via many openings which is why it is so important to know um, the IQP pawn structure I'm going to access this position now via a Tarash move order um, like so but just to demonstrate a point, I will show you how it's uh, actually reached via a Karakan Panov move order. Exact same position is going to occur. occur. Watch this. Rookie one, well, knight of six, a three, and da. There we are. <gasps> Excuse me. And um, we have arrived right away at the point of discussion for today. And for a short period of time, I'm going to flip the board around because we are not black or white. We are understanding and learning about the structure and the... Uh, the uh, plants that are typical to this position and so there's absolutely no harm in fact there is a great benefit to study it from both sides so uh in this position typically black aims to develop the bishop uh, to the long diagonal to b7 for multiple reasons a because it has nowhere else to go two because that where that's where it stands best three because it covers the d5 square from there yada 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 however there are two ways to go about business. One of them is to play a6, b5. And the other one is to say play b6, bishop, b7 right away. And um, it may be tempting to uh, opt for a6, b5 here. But that's exactly what my mini lecture for this video is going to be about. My personal experience shows and demonstrates that b6 here is a much, much better move. Uh, than a6 is, which is quite funny because when I'm looking at the engine Eva now, the difference between the two is literally 0 0.02. So it's like ignorable. But let me demonstrate to you why I'm saying what I'm saying and hopefully that is going to make a very compelling case. So after a6, white's best move is bishop a2 and then black plays b5. Right, so we remove the bishop from the tempo and now we are good to go. Now this is a very unique case of a... Um, uh, IQP in the sense that black has uh, no sufficient blockaders on the d5 square and so the d5 push is definitely on the cards in fact it is by far the best move and from here on out black is walking on extremely thin ice and uh, it's super easy to find themselves on a very slippery slope ed knight d and at this point, according to the engine, the black has only one move, only one move that allows black to stay in the game, which is an extremely, well, I wouldn't say extremely counterintuitive, but it's definitely not uh, a move that you would be like, yeah, let's do that. And that move, by the way, is none other than rook a7. And after bishop b3, rook d7, knight e7, and then let's say knight takes, White definitely enjoys the upper end due to um, the two bishops and the greater piece mobility. But black is fairly sturdy here uh, for the time being. At least the engine is uh, probably more optimistic about black's chances than any human would be. A very famous game for this structure is Kasparov Larsen. Yeah, Kasparov, but there is a Dolmatov game too. I'm getting confused now. It's in Dvoretsky's box. And now I'm getting a bit confused if it was a Dolmatov game. Anyway, long story short, this is it. Uh, and everything else pretty much loses by force. I have had a fair number of games, including the one I played today, where black played knight takes d5. And this trade pretty much by force leads to... Uh, Black's collapse. Queen d5 loses on the spot to bishop d5 and two pieces are loose. The game is over. So uh, bishop b7 is more or less forced. And this is where the trickery comes. Queen h5. This very cool side swing uh, to the edge of the board ensures that white has got a lasting initiative 
and the very annoying one at that knight g5 is uh the main threat or bishop g5 first and then the retake on um g5 i have had at least three games in the past very short period of time uh where my opponents played bishop f6 i played bishop g5 now the game winning threat is rook a d1 once again note the piece mobility and this is by the way a very very nice demonstration of the concept that it's all fine and dandy that you have developed all your pieces, but that very often is not going to cut the cheese at all. Like black here is completely done with development. Admittedly, the rooks are not quite connected yet, but the minor pieces are out. But they are out in a way that is absolutely meaningless to the position. These two pieces are as if they were not even on the board. And um, yeah, I had a game about half a year ago where my opponent played in 94 and I completely failed. Uh, to find the win here, which is quite funny by the way, because white has one winning move and everything else is just triple zeros. Everything else. It's insane. The main idea behind knight d4 is, is that after bishop takes, black has bishop takes here. And uh, that immediately uh, leads to a very, very drawish scenario. Anyway, so I didn't really succeed with the game, so I looked it up afterward and it turns out that I have got knight e5 here. And ever since I've played at least two games, maybe even three, where I remembered that knight e5 was the win. It's very nice, by the way. Bishop takes uh, uh, g5 and uh, any take on f7 wins. I think I played knight takes, actually, but uh, bishop takes is even more convincing. I'm not sure. Obviously, king h8 is mate, and if takes, then check, and you pick off uh, the bishop, and that's about the size of it. Now, to demonstrate how brutally cruel and at the same time cute chess is, um, one of those games went with knight a free check. And it's never too late to go too cocky. Because here, again, I have one winning move. <gasps> That's it. And that one winning move is gf. If you take with the knight, it's instantly gone. Bishop takes f3. And yeah, forget about it. White has lost all the advantage. All of it. Dead draw. But gf3 was played and my opponent promptly resigned. The game is over now. Um... The game I played today featured g6 here, which is also really bad, because now after queen h4 takes, takes, white has got tremendous attack down here, down here, down here, f7 is hurting like crazy. Uh, h5 was played, I played rook a d1, turns out it's an inaccuracy, the best move is queen f4 first to deny queen f6, but my opponent did not play queen f6 here, which they really should have. Um, by the way, he white's best is queen g3, renewing the rook d6 check and uh, threat. And um, yeah, white is completely killing it still. My opponent played queen c7, and I just uh, completely went bananas here. Uh, well, actually, not through. I did the right thing. I took on f7. My opponent took back. I played queen f6, which was the correct move. And I totally failed to spot here a very, very, very brutally simple forced win i would like to invite you dear viewer uh to make this uh, as an exercise for the viewer the remainder of this puzzle um a super basic forced win for white is what you need to do i took g6 and then i traded down on f7 traded queens actually i'll show you but uh it's nothing but embarrassment that i did this take 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 rook d5 now don't get me wrong this is about plus four like i'm absolutely killing it and in fact, my opponent played 97 and after rook d7, they promptly resigned. But that does not excuse me from not playing in this position a painfully, painfully obvious uh, winning sequence. So that's for you, dear reader, to work out or dear viewer. Um, I'm going to show it to you now in case you failed. So the idea that I missed here was rook d5. And uh, the threat is uh, very simply to go check first. So against the pass, I go check. Uh, rook can't block because rook hangs on f8 with mate. King here, and this is mate due to the pin. That was the little touch I missed. I also missed that here after rook h7. Um, we have got multitude of wins based on this idea. That was my main miss. Um, this move here and yeah the idea is that rook f5 is met by mate on g8 beautiful attack um, the queen defends f8 then i take and rook e8 wins the queen 
and if the rook uh, goes anywhere on the back rank, then we have got rook here check with a subsequent uh, checkmate. Probably prettiest would be check, check here, check here and here. Not bad. So yeah, that's guys basically the story of the a6b5. Very tempting, but in fact, in my opinion, really bad. Um expansion on the queen side with the idea of developing the bishop now what is the difference quite cunning if you play b6 instead of a6 b5 then now the matching continuation from white's perspective is to play d5 and after take 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 you could argue that this is looking almost identical for most intents and purposes and white should be comfortably sailing toward a victory here now that would be more or less true, I suppose. But there is a very big difference here, folks, and that comes earlier. And that is none other than because of I had to play d5 with my bishop on c4, I didn't have time for this uh, delicate bishop a2 prophylactic move. After d5, I get hit by knight a5. And that unfortunately means that this doesn't work. I fell for this multiple times, by the way. <clears throat> the only thing that black needs to ensure is that they do not take with a pawn here because that allows b4. And if knight c4, then knight takes d5. And this could get very, very unpleasant for black with all the diagonals and files opening up and lots of loose pieces everywhere. But instead, if they take with the knight, then this sequence appears to be more or less forced. There's no point in playing b4 now because the knight just jumps in. So queen d5 is forced. And after bishop e6 takes, 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 takes. This endgame is dead draw. Although there is a broken pawn, the e6 pawn. But taking it is oh, very risky because now comes check, take, 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 bishop f6. And although white is a pawn up, my pieces are tragically passive. Knight b3 is threatened, rook d8, rook d1 is threatened. Um, the engine correctly evaluates this as black's advantage, so it's out of the question. I can't do that. So I suppose here I can play something like bishop g5 and uh, have a tiny, tiny, tiny edge. But long story short, whilst against a6, bishop a2, b5, d5 is extremely powerful. Against b6 here, I would perhaps uh, shy away from d5 or rather avoid it altogether. And potentially I would play here bishop a2. And if bishop b7, then I think I would be willing to play here my favorite attacking pattern with queen d3, usually followed by bishop g5, rook a d1, and ultimately regarding the bishop to b1 and uh, pursuing our kingside attack agenda down that way. So yeah, there you go, folks. That was a little bit of an extra insight into... Uh, the mysteries of the IQP. Um, this is a textbook case, by the way, when you play a particular opening, whether it be the Tarash or the Karakam Panov, and you understand the fine details. Like we are talking here 20,000, sorry, 2,000 plus uh, depth of understanding and the whys and the, what, the why nots and the, all of that. So I thought that this would be an interesting demonstration of I don't want to sound cocky, but, you know, like a little bit of a higher level of thinking of what difference would this make versus B6. And, you know, most people would uh, either just completely dismiss it that it's irrelevant or doesn't make any difference or I can't be bothered. But I am the type who really enjoys uh, exploring the nuances and the differences and understanding uh, the inner mechani mechanisms of certain positions. And with the IQP, I think this is in particularly a... Uh, very very handy lesson there so yeah that's gonna be it from me for today folks i hope you enjoyed it uh and i will be back with the next video soon thanks for watching oh yeah shout out to uh blaze van dyne and blunder goat and if i forgot anybody else i'm going to make up for you as well but those two have been regularly sending super tanks which basically means donating money to almost every single video i put out there absolute legend and uh, also massive thanks to everybody else whom I forgot to name by name now, but I promise I will make up for that. Uh, that's it for now. Please don't forget to sub to like, to thank or to super thank me. And we'll be back with the next video. Bye.